Funding for Minnesota Hockey Land of 10,000 Rinks is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. So this weekend the temperatures have finally dropped enough for us to begin what we call the 100 hour flood. Parents volunteer um, and sign up for shifts around the clock to put down water and let it freeze so that we can build up a great base layer of ice for this season of hockey. Today, Beginning today and then throughout the weekend we'll just be flooding around the clock. Uh, my name is Casey Gilman. We are here flooding at Congen Park Hockey, making ice for the kids to play on. Overall, it went pretty well. Put a lot of water down and you can hear it freezing now. There's lots of volunteer hours going on and there's a lot of water being put down. And it takes, starts off slow, but once it starts building up, it, it uh, comes together nicely. And it's impressive how fast it actually comes. Coming here and doing what I'm doing now as a, as a father instead of a kid out here playing on the ice, I get a lot bigger respect for what my dad did. You know, you see all the work that actually goes into it just so we, just so we can go out and play as kids. My name is Eric Gustafson and we are at the uh, Glen Avon Hockey Rink. Uh, right now we are working on getting our ice down for the season. We've got a, we've got a good culture going on here where people understand about uh, doing the work and getting things done, keep the cost down. There's something about the hockey culture here in Duluth that seems different than other places that we've lived. Um, it definitely feels like more of a community. It's more accessible to a lot of different people. Uh, our winters are obviously pretty long up here. So I always say that if you don't find a way to sport your way through the winter, um, you might end up being pretty miserable. So it's nice what we, you know, can find an activity where the kids can be active outside and, you know, enjoy the winter and enjoy themselves and their friendships and, and at the same time be part of a team. I have, uh, I have three sons. My oldest is playing now and I did it growing up. I grew up in the Duluth area playing on these same rinks and my dad did it. It's kind of a way of life for us and it uh, puts a smile on, on my kid's face and every other kid's face out there. So that's why we do it, for kids. Well, the main thing for the kids is that uh, it's fun. 
you know, it's, it's playing a sport. It's getting outside, making friends, and, and having fun. Um, you know, if any of them turn into good hockey players, that's just a bonus, but that's not the important part of it. It's northern Minnesota. It's, uh, hockey's a big thing around here. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good way to spend your winter. I, in my opinion, it beats sitting inside. I'm one of many, many of the parents in the Duluth Hockey Association that grew up here, so every time I go to another rink, there's 10 or 15 more faces that I haven't seen for 20 years, and, and it's, it's fun. You know, you get out here on a good night, and tons of kids playing around and having a good time. Family's here. Everybody loves it. We love hockey here in Duluth. That's kind of the long and short of it right there. I think there's just never been a time he didn't want to play. My husband, he played hockey, so I think AJ had his first pair of skates when he was probably three and a half. I come here almost every day. Um, I'm Alex Gazel, but some people call me AJ, and I'm in sixth grade. I remember like maybe around the first year because the first time was kind of tough. I remember I fell the first step on the ice, but there, it, it, since there it was all really fun. He dreams of that. We'd love to play for the Bulldogs someday. And I mean, it's hockey is his life this time of year anyway. <laughs> it's just fun to play. It's a game that'll keep you busy. It's kind of like a hobby. It's just I want to do it all the time. I'm Keith Alverson. I've been with the hockey, ESCO Hockey Association for a few years now. I'm currently the ESCO um, Hockey Association president of the board. We've been growing every year for a small town of ESCO. We've been uh, uh, growing, now we have 70, almost 70 kids strong. And uh, last year alone we had 30% increase. So we've got five might one teams and two might two teams and we look forward to growing every year. The parents are the ones that are out here when it's 10 below zero and they're flooding the rinks. The, the moms are committing two, three, four nights of, you know, during the season when they're working concessions. I mean, it, it's all volunteer, you know, you've got the tournaments and I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge volunteer commitment. I mean, you can see it here, this is a range of ages of kids who are skating and, and how well they play with each other. and, and I, I tell him now as one of the older kids of just remember how good they were to you and you make sure you're that good to the younger kids of just letting them get involved and play and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's something special. It's really the beauty of uh, rat rank hockey is you get little kids, you get uh, older kids and every kid is able to play with uh, children of different skill levels and that's where they grow, they're challenged in some times and then they get to help out the little kids and uh, it's, it's got a lot of learning benefits for, for kids uh, skill development. So the more you get that uh, you could be playing on a team with kids aging from ranges 5 up to 13 and uh, that really helps all the kids grow. In some moments they're a teacher, in other moments they're the student. I mean now that he's playing in Cloquet they're for the most part playing indoors but Last year, they, they got to play in a couple of outdoor tournaments, and I just had to laugh because, you know, at the ripe old age of 10, he's like, oh, this brings back so many good memories to be skating outside. You get to bond with your friends. It'll build your build relationships. It's just really fun, fun to play. There's something magical about outdoor hockey. I liken it to like a field of dreams, like in the, in the baseball movie, where there's an ideal little baseball field in the middle of nowhere. Well, here we have an ideal hockey rink that's uh, iconic in so many ways. Well, my name is Patrick Francisco. Um, I grew up in the west side of Duluth, went to Denfeld High School, uh, played hockey at UMD, loved this community, loved Duluth. Um, I'm a volunteer uh, in the Heritage Center Project. 
There were, first of all, lots of folks involved in this, uh, this effort. You know, the impetus was the burning down of Peterson Arena uh, near Wheeler Field. And then the idea just kind of grew. It grew into a bigger concept, a concept of historic renovation of these historic buildings uh, here at the uh, Essentia Health and Lutheran Sports Center. It grew into economic development and broadening our mission that went beyond hockey, including the Boys and Girls Club and sports camps and so forth. It was a totally volunteer effort that put this thing together. And what we did wanted to do is not only have an ice sheet, for the kids to skate on, the high school teams to skate on, but we wanted to celebrate the heritage of hockey in Duluth. I'm Jerry Freiberger, and I was introduced to hockey in about 1943. It's a first class facility. It's got a lot of warmth, and of course, the heritage adds tremendous to it. When you put 500, 600 people in here, 1,000 people in here, it's a raucous environment and the kids have a lot of fun and the players enjoy it. The community likes it and it's, uh, it's turning out the way we hope. You know, grandmothers and grandfathers come in here and see themselves um, in these pictures and, uh, uh, and they see their grandchildren now out here. It's, uh, it's pretty special. We want to intentionally show intergenerational connectedness. So a kid today, a, a young kid, a high school kid, understands that people came before them to help pave the way so that they can have the things that they enjoy. In my lifetime, which is quite a few years, I don't remember a project like this being done without uh, tax dollars. So it's pretty remarkable. And the community needs to be proud of themselves because uh, it, it was a collaborative effort. My dad was in the iron ore business. So during the uh, depression, there was no money to have a youth hockey program. and. Uh, then uh, during the war, there was nobody to coach. So he and Ray Peterson and Rip Williams were the ones who said, let's get these kids back on the ice. And so they built rinks, you know, outside rinks. That's all we had. Our Mount Rushmore across there with, with uh, the, the Freiberger family and, the, and the, um, uh, the Williams family from the Central Hillside and the Peterson family from the west side of Duluth. Uh, that brings this community together. This is a total Duluth community uh, center, and it's for the whole community. My father would not recognize the, the quality of play, and neither would Roy uh, Ray Peterson or Rip Williams. It's just been fantastic. You come and look at our college wall, and you see all these kids who, who took and used hockey to uh, pursue education. And uh, we have hundreds of, of those kids uh, that played on some pond or rink in Duluth that uh, went on to wear a jersey from some college. So when you come through here and you look at all of these uh, Olympic and pro athletes and, the, and, and Hobie Baker winners and, and whatever there are Duluth kids, you know, hopefully that inspires kids. We focus so much at the, at the professional level now, but that isn't the real value of hockey. The value is teamwork. Uh, sportsmanship learn, and the rules and uh, they build that enthusiasm and discipline to get in shape, go out there and be part of the team, contribute to the part of the team and be a wonderful teammate and encourage your teammates. As Blake comes back to full strength, their penalty kill does the job, it stays 1-0. Now a chance in for Proctor Herbert, that shot, score! It's a score for Sophie McGovern. That's just what they needed. I think the biggest change is that girls are starting younger now. You know, we have uh, we have a couple of U10 teams and some U12 teams, and and when we first started, we were we were walking through the junior high and senior high halls trying to get people to play hockey. This year, we're like a lot deeper of a team than we have been in the past. Like, I started playing on the team when I was in eighth grade but like that doesn't happen anymore. Our youngest person on the team now is a sophomore in high school. So it's just like, it shows how much it's come in the last like five years that I've been on the team. And I came home and the boys had been talking about hockey and I was in kindergarten and I didn't really think anything of it. And then I came home and I'm like, mom, dad, I want to play hockey and they're like, no, you don't. And I'm like, yeah, I do. And so 
They let me try it and I've been playing ever since. Well, I used to live in Babbitt, so up on the range, and my brother and sister played, and I never wanted to play. I used to figure skate, and then one day my mom and dad just put me on the ice, and I loved it. My dad loves hockey. My mom was a little torn that I was giving up gymnastics, because that was kind of, I'm the only girl in the family, so that was like the girly sport. But both my parents are super supportive and have been all the way up. It's a different brand of hockey, you know, it's a, it's, there's, there's no checking, there's a lot of contact. Um, if you watched a game, you'd be surprised, but the big thing is it's, there's a lot of puck movement. Hockey is hockey, it's played the same way. The only difference to me is that boys can check, girls can't. Girls hockey is still physical. I mean, some people are like, oh, like girls hockey, you can't do anything, like it's no contact. I wouldn't say that, I would say it's still contact, it's just not a full-on check. People still do hit each other, so. Um, you know, they can angle into the boards, that's legal to do, and that's done, and there's contact in front of the net, but it's, it's more of a puck movement. I've had people tell me before that they really enjoy watching the, the girls' game because of all the puck movement. When people come to games who haven't seen girls' hockey, they're really surprised at the pace of the game. Like, especially in the last few years, it has, like, picked up, and it's really become, like, a really good game to watch. I love the competitive aspect of it. I'm a competitive person and so to be able to play a sport that is so competitive and you get rewarded obviously like you score goals. Yeah we have a really strong team. This is the deepest team that we've had in a while. Good skating. We all are really good friends so that like makes it really easy off ice and on ice there's good chemistry. We have three lines. Um, a lot of girls high school teams don't have three lines, they play two lines. So when, when we play three lines against them, that's an advantage for us. Um, I think this is probably the best team I've been on for girls hockey. Um, we have a lot of depth going on, so I think we can make it pretty deep in the playoffs. Last year, going to state tournament, that was a huge thing for, I, I would say, probably almost every one of them out there right now. That's all, it's, it's just the experience of a lifetime. Yeah, that's the goal this year is to get back down there and do better than we did last year. Playing in the state hockey tournament in Minnesota, there's no other thing like it. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. The Freiburgers are obviously huge in Duluth with, with hockey. And they, they started Glen Avon when the Woodland kids wouldn't let him play anymore. So he went back to his dad and said, we got to start our own rink. And that's how they started Glen Avon. It was a kid's idea. My parents were very much into education, and uh, very much. They were a little concerned that all we did was hunt, fish, and play hockey. And, uh, and so unfortunately, that, they were right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we thought that was all right. We had a rink uh, just across the street from where we lived on 1941 Waverly Avenue, and uh, that rink is still going. This is the 70th year. And all the neighborhood kids skated there. We had nothing organized. We were just kind of playing, I call sandlot hockey, you know, it was a shinny. We would, you know, we didn't choose up sides. So we didn't have any boards. We just skated on the rink and had a grand time. Then I got a call, I, and we think it was 1950, from a, a good friend, Billy Baudry, who skated on the rink there. And Billy said, uh, hey, how would you guys like to be part of a team in the city leagues? My mother said, your team has to have a jersey. And so she went to Sears and Roebuck and for a buck and a half bought red jerseys. And, uh, and then she took felt, she bought it J.C. Penney, and cut out in a cursive manner, Glen Avon. It just started out a little spark. One call from a guy named Bill Bowdry. It started the whole thing. It's just amazing. My dad was an All-American hockey player at Dartmouth, and so he showed us a lot of things. We all looked up to our dad because my dad was a very um, low-key guy, but he in a very nice way taught us how the game should be played. It was very disciplined. You skate your position, you pass the puck forward, and, and you share that puck, and it was so a lot of teamwork. You can't back check unless you move those legs. You can't score goals unless you shoot. And we had a, a, a classmate at Dartmouth, uh, 
And he said, Bob, why don't uh, Minnesota has lots of hockey teams? Do you have a, a club that would like to play in the National Pee Wee Championship? He said, sure. He said, you know, our teams are pretty good. And uh, he said, well, that's fine. He said, we'll bring a team out. And none of us have been as far as Minneapolis, St. Paul. So we got on the train in Duluth and went to Chicago and took the uh, New York Central from Chicago into New York. And we were all upset when we got in a taxi cab that the guy turned the handle and it said 25 cents. And we argued with the guy, you haven't gone any place yet and you charge us 25 cents. So a bunch of hayseeds from Minnesota. <laughs> in Madison Square Garden, we won three games, which is what the championship was. It was certainly uh, quite a thrill to be skating in what we considered the Taj Mahal of, of rinks. We had one huge advantage, and that we skated all winter long. The East Coast schools, they could buy ice time on artificial ice which was not readily available to the, the junior teams and the Kiwis. And so when we got out there, they didn't have a chance. We came at them like a, a bunch of banshees because all we did was play hockey, and that's what we did. And uh, they couldn't believe that we could skate like that. Oh, it was really big. I mean, this is the first national championship that I think a Duluth team had won, uh, unless you go way back into the rowing years when the crews were doing so well here. But after we got off the train in Duluth, we were all put on each player or two players, three players, sat on the back of a convertible as we went through the city of Duluth. And the crowds met, met us and uh, oh, it was, it was overwhelming. We couldn't believe that we had gone to New York and won this thing and that was enough. But now we, they, all these folks met us and Mayor Johnson was there. They got the key to the city and uh, a, a really nice trophy. The neat thing is, is now Glen Avon is using that as their logo. Glen Avon Hockey is, and the parents and coaches have done just a wonderful job. Lots of kids playing hockey and it's a real credit to the, to the support that they get. Ice polo was a popular sport in the 90s in St. Paul, Minneapolis and Duluth and they held tournaments yearly in the sport through 1899. And it was the mining people who actually brought in a professional team into Elvin. And this was right after World War I. They brought in all Canadians to play professional hockey in a little town of 6,000 people. And they competed against towns like uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, uh, Kansas City, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Duluth was a great strong point. The Duluth Hornets, the old amateur team here, and they played the great teams from the Iron Range who were, you know, there wasn't college scholarships at the time. There was college hockey. It didn't mean anything to these guys. And the Duluth Zephyrs, I remember was coached by a fellow by the name of Laurie Scott who played with the New York Rangers for eight years. And the only local player on that team was the late uh, Rip Williams. And uh, the Duluth Zephyrs at that time were the farm team for the Minneapolis Millers. And the Minneapolis Millers was a farm team for the Boston Bruins. Duluth hockey was, was good, but Iron Range hockey was unbelievable. And you had Cliff Thompson at Eveleth, and uh, he coached a few players who went on to play a little, like uh, John Masich, John Matchefs, uh, uh, Finnegan, uh, you know, all these great players. Well, Cliff Thompson uh, was a native of Minneapolis, and uh, he was the, my first and only hockey coach I had. He was a terrific individual. He was an individual, not only as a coach, but as a person who could inspire you. In Eveleth, they had uh, all these great guys who went on to the NHL. Yeah. You know, John Mariucci. I played with John in high school, one year, then one year in JC, and uh, Never did play. When I was coaching at UMD, we didn't play Minnesota. John uh, did a good job coaching at Minnesota and uh, had a very favorable record. Tony Pleban was a great guy. He coached the Olympic teams. 
and, uh, and he really did a great job at UMD. They might not have even had interscholastic hockey at UMD. Might have never grown above the intramural stage without Connie Cleveland's guidance. The year I came down, it was, that's when the, probably the, uh, the move was being made to upgrade the uh, uh, hockey at the university level. I visualized that when I first took the job. I felt that we could go into the uh, Western Collegiate Hockey Conference. And in fact, my communication with the provost at the time was that we were in a hotbed of hockey. We had a lot of talent right here in Duluth. We had uh, up the Iron Range, up on the border, Fort Francis. We had the Lakehead, Winnipeg. We had uh, Fort Francis and uh, Port Arthur, Fort Williams. So we had a nucleus of talent to pick from, and I felt that we could compete with uh, anybody in the Western Conference. Ralph Romano came in. He was. Uh he replaced Connie, and Connie went off and did his thing with the Olympic team and so forth, and was an icon in hockey. So Ralph Romano, he had a couple guys, pretty secret weapons, Keith Huffer Christensen, and Bruce McLeod, who became later the commissioner of the, of the league for years, played on his wing. Pat Francisco was a captain. The second year, they played in the WCHA, and that was uh, when they opened the Duluth arena. Of course, right away their big rival was Minnesota automatically because uh, UMD was the Duluth campus of the university, of course. Our first game was against the hated Minnesota Golden Gophers and we edged them 8-1. to one. So uh, I remember that pretty uh, vividly. Everyone assumed the Gophers were the big favorites and UMD beat them 8-1 uh, to one, and Huffer had six assists. He skated around like the Pied Piper, and he'd have five gophers chasing him, and then he passed to the goal mouth for a goal. Huffer was an amazing player, a little guy, five foot six, and just a magician with a stick. The six assists, by the way, still stands as the UMD all-time record for assists in a game. Probably, if the movie Hoosiers was going to be made about hockey, it would have to be about those Greenway of Coleraine teams. They had players from, like, I think it was 11 different towns and Mike Antonovich from Calumet, and Mick Metzer, and, and uh, the Pelusos, and you know, I mean, it was an amazing story, and Bob Gernander pulled them all together. But these kids grew up in different little, t little areas, so they'd have their own teams. They didn't have many players, but they were fierce rivals, and they hated each other. And they'd all go to Coleraine, where the high school was, the Greenway High School of Coleraine. And so they show up in the state tournament and Mike Antonovich was about a 115 pound sophomore. Tiniest hockey player you ever saw in the state tournament. Greenway won the state title. He literally went under guy's arms and you know, it was amazing. He was a fabulous player. They came back and won it the next year when he was about a 130 pound so uh, junior. And the third year they would have won it again but the goalie made like I think it was Doug Long made 65 saves and set the record and, and beat him in repeated overtimes. <laughs> Gus Hendrickson, who had had a magical run of, he went to Grand Rapids and he put that whole program together. So he came in as coach and he, he made a great inroads for getting the, the Iron Range players and the, you know, the, the Dan Lempies and the, the uh, Mark Pavliches and and uh, some of those really great players from the range. And they got UMD kind of more localized instead of heading towards all Canadian. When they had a falling out, uh, Gus uh, went his separate way and uh, they hired Mike Sertich, one of the legendary stories in hockey. Ralph Romano didn't like Mike Sertich, so he hires him as interim coach. And Mike Sertich wins coach of the year in the WCHA. And the next year he wins it again. He wins it the third straight year. I started with Mike his first year as a coach. I was a freshman. Uh, I think Mike's going to be uh, ready for sainthood when the, when the big guy calls to have us as his first class. But I'm blessed that I had Mike here because Mike kind of just allowed me to play and never put any restrictions on me uh, offensively or defensively or lack of defense. <laughs> uh, but it, that was the same way with Tommy and Kerbers and Norm McIver, Matt Christensen. We were just able to go and play and uh, boy, it made a huge difference. When we won, I think our first WCHA championship against Wisconsin here, I think that one right there was probably the biggest game, I think, in terms of getting it to that crescendo and getting the school and our hockey program over the hump and, and win a championship.
Then they went to the national tournament at Lake Placid, NCAA Final Four, but they lost in uh, four overtimes uh, in an unbelievable game where the this puck was shot in in the last minute. They're leading by a goal, and the puck hits the end boards and comes out in front of the net. And the guy has a tap in to tie the game, and they play four overtimes, and they lose. It was a great memory for 97 minutes and 10 seconds. The last seconds, the worst memory. Um, yeah, it was. I've never watched the game since. Um, People go, why don't you watch the game? I go, because I know the outcome. <laughs> but it was this fine shot by Gino Cavallini late in the fourth OT that gave the Falcons the NCAA Division I championship 5-4 over the Bulldogs. They came back the next year and went to the Frozen Four again at Detroit and lost in three overtimes to RPI. Unbelievable. Norm and I have talked, McIver and I have talked about it a few times. I mean, thinking we're a bounce away from being back-to-back na -back national champions. Uh, and what you appreciate after 30-some years after is you realize how good a team we had. They gave it to Billy Watson. Bingo! 4-4. He's the best there is in college hockey. Those teams were the best teams UMD ever had. And they did establish UMD as an elite program. Not just a good program, but an elite program. And they've stayed up there pretty well. But when they brought in Tom Curvers, he won Hobie Baker. And they brought in Bill Watson, he won Hobie Baker. And the next guy who should have won it, they had Norm McIver, should have well won it. And then they had a guy named Brett Hull. The award itself was kind of in its infancy at the time. Uh, and the year before, Tom had won at Curvers and was very deserving of it. When I won it, it was like, it just absolutely stunned me. Um, I was probably more surprised than anybody. We have, uh, we have five winners. Uh, we have the most in the country. Um, it's, it's, I think we were known for that until we won that national championship in 11. And then it was so nice the next year Jack won the Hobie Baker Award Conley. And uh, it, uh, it's something we're very proud of. When you look at that, of all the great programs, some of the bigger schools, uh, a lot of all the, like the great players that have played uh, for us to have the most, uh, I think it's pretty special to our program and certainly uh, our university. If you are a person of my vintage, um, you know that the game of hockey was played outdoors for most of us. Even some of the high school games back then were played on the outdoor rink. And then we started playing on the inside and uh, at the curling club. Big palatial, like a castle, big heavy rock place. And you can imagine how heavy a hockey arena is. The hockey rink was on the second floor above the curling club. And you walked in, uh, I'll never forget how it's, as you walked in the crackling smell of the radiators and the, you know, people's freezing gloves sitting on the radiators. And, and then you walked into the rink and there was no heat. And it was natural ice and a very small rink. For its, uh, its antiquated type of uh, feel, uh, it was also uh, very intimate, so uh, if you ask fans, if you can find fans that still remember that, um, you know, 2,000 people huddled around a little rink right in the middle of a game with no uh, glass around the rink. I mean, they felt like they were part of the game. You felt like you might be playing left wing when you were sitting in the stands, and uh, no chicken wire around the, except on the ends. Then my senior year was 1966 and 67, that's the beginning of the deck. And so our team opened the deck. We were the first team that played at the, uh, at the Duluth uh, Entertainment Convention Center. That was like um, nirvana to us, you know, that was pretty cool. Fabulous, it set UMD apart because it was the best arena and people here I don't think even appreciated it or realized it. Probably wasn't until I got to high school and you started traveling more to some of these other buildings around there. It's just like all those buildings on the range where there's that one, two, three, four very significant hockey people that you knew cut their teeth in those buildings. It can be a little bit intimidating walking into some of these places. Going back to like it was with the Hippodrome, knowing that some of these names that played in these places are really significant in the game of hockey. At other arenas, the parents are all cynics and critics and they, they know better than the coach, so they're always second-guessing. 
At Eveleth, they would run up to the bar a block up the hill, and the bar stools were the cynics and critics, and most of them were in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> go into Virginia and see a picture of Bob Harrington or go into Hibbing and see a picture of Mike Polich and it starts to kind of resonate with you like wow there's there's some huge names that are skating on the same ice sheet that I am. It definitely had a historical aspect to it especially when you did walk in and, and see a picture of Bob Harrington in there and know that uh, Mike Surtich from UMD was from there. The Hibbing building, a magnificent edifice where they would play the, the region finals. And I'll never forget the great guy who was there forever as the PA guy. He w honestly would say, okay, you kids, get off of the rafters. They were literally hanging from the rafters. But I think just playing in that building in the, in the, in the section final when it's probably five or 6,000 people in the building, it was a great atmosphere. Uh, and the people are hanging from the rafters and you know, it was a really exciting time. And my favorite was uh, since renamed Hodgson's Berardo in Coleraine. You walked in there and there was never any thought that it, anything was important except hockey. I mean, you walked in there and yeah, there was a nice warm lobby and you got your hot dog or popcorn or coffee. When you went into the rink, it was cold and it was they had little walkways that came out over the goals, and that's where the goal judge sat, looking straight down on it. The goal judges over the ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, there's so many unique things about that building. I, I love playing there. Hodges Barado Arena in Coleraine is one of my favorite buildings of all time. I started going there when I was really young. We, uh, the first hockey school I ever went to was the Greenway Hockey School run by Bob Gernander. I loved playing there. I don't know what it was watching. It was always fun to go to the other side because you got to go across the catwalk. It didn't matter how it looked. What mattered was the game. The ice was great. The game was great. And uh, that was just a fantastic place to watch. <sighs> oh, got frozen. It's a little stiff. Well, it's frozen, Bob. My dad started the rink in 1947. He put it in the backyard at 1941, where the garden is, and then that wasn't big enough, so he moved it to the front yard, and that wasn't big enough, so then in 1946 or 47, he bought the lot across the street. And, uh, and we used the hydrant, the fire department gave us the hoses, uh, and we used the hydrant to flood it, and it was a very easy deal. <laughs> oh boy. This is the, going to be the 70th year. I started doing this when I was 10 years old. For whatever reason, I don't know why, but we continually do it. The kids continue to skate. It was, uh, it was all done on volunteers. Volunteer shoveling, volunteer flooding, and um, lots of experiences. We all learned how to flood, good or bad. Nonetheless, the kids were we're all part of it. Shoveling snow was part of it. Ready to go? Yep. Pull the hose a little bit here, will you, Bob? Yeah. Hey, Robert? Yeah. Pull that hose. Yeah, I will. <laughs> okay. Bob, he's ice. One time I, I went and looked at uh, a book on ice and the Russians had about 15 volumes on ice. And <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> this is the home we grew up in right here. Yeah, 1941 Waverly Avenue. The back hall was a changing room but my mother would put on um, lunch, and the kids said, Mrs. Freiberger, do I have to take my skates off? And she said, no, as long as you, you walk without sliding on the oriental rugs, which would have ruined the rugs, everybody has to just take a simple step, 
and uh, make sure you don't push off like you're skating. And so the kids would, you'd have 15 kids there with skates on underneath the table. After a big snowstorm, my mother and father, or my mother particularly, would get phone calls. Is the rink cleared? Oh yeah, it's all done, boys. You can come on over and you can play. Well, there was still two feet of snow, but he said, why don't you just grab a shovel and you can clear it off. He said, your mom fooled us in getting out here. But. My name is uh, Steve Noldeen. I grew up a couple blocks away from here uh, at the Freiburger Ice Rink. And I used to skate here about 25, 30 years ago, all the time with my friends. And uh, I live out of state now, and I was able to come back home just after Christmas this year with my family, and I was able to bring my son here and um, bring him up here to the rink where I spent a good part of my, my youth playing hockey and learning how to skate. I see these kids enjoying it and laughing and falling down and getting up and chasing the puck and passing it and so forth and so it's so it brings back all sorts of great memories and it's almost exactly as I remember it they change the light up in the pole but otherwise you can still turn it on and off yourself you can come out here at night and clean the rink off and have a great time I think we gotta shut her off okay Whoa! Hey! Hey! <laughs> wrong way! Wrong way! <laughs> I was so impressed with my wrench, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> they hung on to it, though. Well, yeah, I couldn't have held on too much longer. The eyes of college hockey on Amsoil Arena. Welcome in Bulldog Hockey on 92 on the fan on the Red Rock Radio Bulldog Sports Network. It is one versus two. The second rate UMB Bulldogs at home to take on the number one undefeated defending national champion Fighting Hawks from the University of North Dakota. Growing up in Duluth, uh, we had season tickets for the Bulldogs. Uh, we came, we came every night we could, and so I just I fell in love with with the team. And um, yeah, I guess ever since I can remember, it, it's always been a dream to play here. Now Pullman center, he'll go back to the left, down low Polganski and back Besser on the right. Besser gives on the goal line centering pass. Oh, what a save, Miska! My name is Dominic Toninato. I'm from Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, Play here my whole life except for one year. I think it's a fun age group to coach. I think uh, the guys are very motivated. Um, you know, they obviously want to continue to, to play beyond college at the highest level. And you know, our job here is to make sure they have a, a real good experience. Um, I think we tell everyone, you know, if you we want you to come in and at the end be a better better hockey player, but more importantly, a better person. And I think when you leave there, you're ready for maybe the next step, whether it's hockey or life. Now Coleman's going to carry the center. We got a hook. Coming up yep, we got a hook. Yep. Coleman over the line. Coleman's hey, score! Hey! And Coleman and the Bulldogs have scored first! Um, I remember my dad would bring us down and we'd watch and I, I thought how cool it would be to play here and I didn't really realize it was a, it was a real possibility until I got later on in my hockey career. My name is Carson Coleman. I'm from Esco, Minnesota. Um, short drive here from Duluth. I grew up playing in Esco and then made the switch over to Cloquet. I know we've been pretty fortunate to have a lot of great kids in the program and makes it a lot of fun and hard-working kids, kind of blue-collar, just like our area. They kind of take on that temperament, too. Oh, UMD was always number one there. Um, first option, obviously growing up watching them. Uh, they are my favorite team. My dad played here, so um, once I got the opportunity, I jumped right on it, and you know, it was a dream come true. Uh, my name is Adam Johnson. I'm from Hibbing, Minnesota. Um, grew up playing there my whole life. Uh, and then played a couple years in Sioux City and uh, now I'm here in my second year at UMD. Jared Thomas on the right wing. Good work by Susie to keep it in. Now Susie scores! Carson Susie let it go, right circle. Power play goal, it's 2 nothing. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I've never been on a winning team like this before, like a number one team. So, 
it's really exciting for the guys, and I think we have a really good group here and something special. So hopefully we can keep it going and um, you know stay up top. 15 in the period, penalty time about to expire. Well, Landon kept it in, shot blocked by Spurl. Old Osmus to keep it in. Back this way to Willanen off his stick and out to center. Here comes Axel the other way. Three seconds in the period. Axel in the middle for Spurl. A shot he put it wide and the period is over. And listen to this ovation for the Bulldogs. I grew up a Bulldog fan and obviously playing in northern Minnesota, your favorite school is UMD and uh, that was a dream to play here. My name is Jared Thomas from Hermantown, Minnesota. Uh, I played high school in Hermantown and uh, currently a junior here at UMD. Obviously the facility is one of the top of the line. Uh, arenas in the country, but yeah, it's just a great place to come every day and lace up the skates and play a game that you love. Obviously, when you come here and you see what you know the players have, and you know the guts of the rink is important to, to us where we spend our time, and you know they have a lot of things that uh, the deck didn't have. It's a big uh, recruiting factor for people. You know, it's one of the best rinks I think around, and having such a new facility, I think, is a big help, and it you know it makes it great, um, a lot of fun to play here. Oh, I love it. Uh, our facilities here are top of the line. Um, obviously, our student section and crowd is great too, and uh, and it's great to pack this place. I think the people are are on top of you, and I think the atmosphere is good. And to Kuhlman in the middle. Kuhlman walks in down, long centering pass, great shot, they score! It's Osterberg, short-handed, three to zero Bulldogs. My whole four years here have been pretty special and, and memorable. Um, like I said, I, I dreamed of being a Bulldog since I was young and, and that dream came true and now to be able to captain the team is, is something really special. That's why this year is so much fun. We're um, having some success and that just makes it that much better. The, the great prize in it all is when, when people see it. It means something to them. Since I was a little boy, that's all I wanted to do was draw. I loved it. So my name is Tim Cortez, and I am what is called, what I call, a commemorative sports artist. Um, sports art is not all, the only thing I do, but it's about 90% of my work. And how, how it works is a group will give me a call, say, look, we're celebrating this, uh, a coach's retirement, uh, national championship, uh, anniversary, and they'll hire me to do a artwork to commemorate that event. My older brother Mike is a goaltender and he started at Portman at five years old and uh, immediately became a goaltender when one of the other kids was sick. So me, I had to follow what my brother was doing. I loved playing goalie and that's it. I got started at the local rink here. I just remember putting them on and just not taking them off and I just stayed out there, stayed out. I didn't care how cold it was. I just loved taking shots. And I did all the way up until two years ago. I just couldn't get enough, so. Once a goalie, always a goalie. Always, always a goalie. Now I'm coaching them and I love that. As I got back into coaching goalie, I took some time off a few years and then Mike asked me if I was interested to coach at East. And of course, of course I was. I had two things I wanted to do. I wanted to play in the NHL. I didn't do that. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm done with that. I'm going to be a commercial artist. And the first professional job that I did was a picture of Lou Nanny. Uh, he was going in the Hall of Fame in, in Eveleth. And they said, hey, will you do this for us? And so I did it. And what it is, is it's still life, really. I get the artifacts and the stuff from the organization. I set it up in my other room, start taking pictures. I just take pictures with my phone. So that's the process. I just take those pictures, find my artboard, and I just sketch it out the way I see it. And it's very meticulous work, but I'm used to it. I've done probably 2,000 pictures in the last 20 years. I'm the worst gauger of time. After all the pictures that I do, I have a guy in my head that says, you got time, you know, don't worry <laughs> about it. 
you can always finish it in the last 48 hours. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the stuff like this is really a brain game sometimes. You've, you've really got to be accurate to, to do a, a medal from the state tournament. That takes a lot of time and precision, you know, and sharp pencils. <laughs> yeah. I love drawing trophies. I, it's a challenge and I, I love to do it. In old jerseys, I could draw them all day long. This is my rink that I grew up at, and later on in life, I was the rink director there. So I was really, really happy when they decided they wanted to do this. I have a few of my own artifacts in there, which I, I told them right off, I said, hey, if I'm doing this, I'm putting my first goalie mask in there. So that was my first goalie mask. That was my jersey. It's my brother's jacket. And this just is very, very special. This was done when UMD, um, back in 2011, won the national championship. First national championship they ever had. What they did with this and another one that I did for the women's is they blew them up to about six feet and framed them. So when you walk in the entrance, the players entrance at Amsoil Arena, on the women's side, you have the, their national championship, huge. On the men, you have this. And I'm very, very proud of that. I did one for Gordy Hall when he got put into the uh, into the Hall of Fame, and going and meeting them at the hotel, taking a bunch of pictures with them, and they were so blown away that somebody could do that. The wife starts crying, and I did, that's a home run to me when people do that, and uh, that was pretty special for me. Here we honor those that have made the contributions to make American hockey what it is today, and it really is great today. I'm Doug Palazzari, the Executive Director of the United States Hockey Hall of Fame Museum. Hockey is all over the country now. We have great athletes playing in all the states. The players are coming from everywhere. We're on par with any hockey playing country in the world now, and, and that's something that's taken a lot of years to accomplish. To have it here is totally appropriate because of all the history that it has with hockey. And then when you start going around the place and realizing the, the huge history that there is in the, not only Minnesota but in the United States of hockey. I love that it's in Avalon. You know, as, as much as people would want to see it in the Twin Cities or maybe in their town on the range, I love that it's in Avalon. Just for the tie to the Hippodrome, the tie to John Mariucci, the ties to Johnny Masich, who may have been the greatest college player of all time. This area is one of the birthplaces of hockey in our country, and they've been playing here since the late 1800s, early 1900s. So it's, it's really in the culture up here, and Eveleth just happened to have, uh, I think, the facilities ahead of other people and other places, and, and uh, a lot of really good athletes. Eveleth's had an indoor rink since the early 1900s. Uh, you know, the current Hippodrome that there was built, I think, in about 1922, and there was a previous indoor rink before that. The Eveleth Hippodrome is a cathedral of high school hockey in Minnesota when you start to think about how long it's been there and some of the people that have, have come through there. Inside that Eveleth Hippodrome, it's like a shrine. You know, it's just beautiful. Any kid that lives here that walks in here would like to be up on that wall one day. Eveleth has, has an incredible culture of hockey here. And people love it. And they're all fans of the sport from little kids up through the NHL. Eveleth was a hockey factory and every generation had one, two, or three even more significant players that came from Eveleth. You'd walk into the Hippodrome in Eveleth and you'd see a picture of John Masich and a picture of John Mariucci and a picture of, you know, whoever the player may be, Doug Pelizzari. In the 60 Olympics, of course, you have John Masich uh, uh, from Eveleth. In the 56 Olympics, you had John Matchev and Mayasic and Willard Eichela all playing, and, and the coach was John Mariushi, all from Eveleth. And so this, this place is just a, 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 a wonderful mecca. And when people do come here, they say, wow, is that ever a great place? Walking in and seeing 
The wall with all the NHL logos was cool, and the never-ending loop of the 1980 Olympic game against the Soviet Union was cool. We have a lot of nice uh, video presentations. The kids love to shoot pucks. We've got a couple of shooting areas. So everybody's a little bit different for what they, what they enjoy. I wish more people would take the time to make the trip up there and see that because for the game in the United States, it's such a significant piece of our history. If you like American hockey, this is a place to go. Growing up here in Eveleth, all the youngsters wanted to play hockey. We played as kids outside all the time. Uh, you got into the Hippodrome on Saturday mornings. The rest of your hockey was all outdoors. The sticks in my day, we the most expensive stick was a $2.50 Northland Pro. And I'll tell you, when you had one of those, you made sure you took good care. But there was one that you could buy for 75 cents. Back when I was a kid and the National Hockey League only had six teams, uh, it was not on television. Uh, we'd rarely see a National Hockey League game. Frank Brimsek, Paracas. These guys, at the time, you know, there was only six teams in the NHL, and like three of them had bullies from the Iron Range, you know, from Eveleth. Trying to get kids to skate and be outside and have fun. Enjoy the outdoors. That's what this is all about. It uh, puts a smile on my kid's face and every other kid's face out there. So that's why we do it, for kids. In Duluth is the only place in North America where there's actually little kids' leagues that still play outside. That's amazing. I think I was five, four or five years old and dad came home with all new hockey gear and tossed it on me in the basement and I absolutely hated it. Um, brought me to the rink, couldn't skate obviously, absolutely hated it, but he just kept telling me to keep going, keep trying, and keep getting back up and finally learned how to skate and ever since then I fell in love with the game. I, I think when I look back on it, the one thing I just I, I, I loved more than anything was just the feeling of scoring a goal and contributing to your, your team winning a game. You know, the games are forgotten, the trophies are stored away, um, but the character you build uh, playing this wonderful game is, uh, there's nothing like it, absolutely nothing like it. Funding for Minnesota Hockey Land of 10,000 Rinks is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.